Hello, and welcome to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event. My name is Simon Montgomery. Uh, I am the Regional Director of Movers and Shakers. For those of you who are new to Movers and Shakers, welcome. Uh, we are the leading property networking forum in the UK. This year is indeed our 25th year of delivering events, bringing together key players from both the private and public sectors. On to today, this lunchtime session, the changing investment agenda in the South West, balancing commerciality with social responsibility and sustainability. We will explore lots of topics. How has COVID affected the market? What are the prospects for the region, the opportunities for investment, and the challenges of getting projects off the ground? The big issue for investors over the last 12 months has been balancing commerciality with social responsibility and sustainability. And to talk about all things investments, we have assembled a fabulous panel. Today, we will be chaired by Maria Connolly, who is the head of real estate for CLT, Oledi Obo, who is the director of partnerships at First Base, Alex Note, who is a placemaking investment director at PFP Capital, and Pete Gladwell, who is head of public sector partnerships for legal and general. Today, our sponsors are TLT. Uh, TLT is a law firm which grew from Bristol and now has six offices across England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. With a national reach and a local insight, it has one of the largest real estate groups in the country. In the Southwest, TLT works with leading commercial and residential property developers, investors and social housing providers. Recent projects include advising on the regeneration of Temple Court on the, on the Temple Quarter district and working with Cubex Land on the multi-million pound Paragon development. We have a great relationship with TLT, which we value greatly and we thank them for. On to today, I hope you enjoy today's session. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to Maria. Maria, over to you. Thanks very much, Simon. Good afternoon, everybody, and delighted to uh, chair uh, the session this afternoon with our fantastic panel lineup. As Simon says, I head our national real estate group at TLT and also head our clean energy sector. And I think there's no better time for the world of real estate, uh, sustainability and clean energy to, to really come together. And I think the Southwest has an absolute tremendous opportunity to, to play a really key part in our sort of road to uh, net zero. So it's certainly a theme that I'd like to pick up with our panelists throughout this afternoon. Um, also an opportunity though, for you to answer, to, to ask us some, some questions. So you can do that through the Q&A tab, which should just be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please do uh, raise any questions uh, on this important topic as we go through uh, the session. I did something similar uh, a couple of weeks ago for the Northwest uh, region, actually, and the, the, the number of questions were absolutely fantastic. So, so no pressure, but it'd be great to see the Southwest uh, doing even better than we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. So moving on to very much the green recovery. Lots of talk at the moment about how the green recovery can really help us move forward uh, out of sort of COVID and perhaps some incentivization as well for organizations who really do demonstrate uh, green credentials. Um, a lady coming to you first, uh, net zero strategies, uh, enabling zero carbon futures, pretty critical across your portfolio. Keen to explore as to whether the dial has changed perhaps uh, in the past six months since, since COVID. I, I think the dollar has been changing for a long time, and I think um, 2020 has brought it much more to the forefront. Um, I think as an industry, we know that we contribute to some of the biggest environmental impacts, whether it's through our energy use, through construction, through the building materials that we use. But I think 2020 has showed us that gone are the days of us being ignorant about that. We've got to be much more, um, it, you know, it, it's not just, it, it's, you know, we're getting so much more questions from our occupiers are demanding more, our residents are demanding more, local authorities are declaring climate emergencies and are saying you've got to do much better. Um, our investors are also saying we will not invest unless there's a specific ESG portfolio. So I think, for, and, and as my two-year-old or my five-year-old continue to tell me, David Attenborough also says so. So as far as we're concerned, as an industry, the days of being ignorant and naive about this are gone. And um, 
for us as a business, sustainability and social value is the most important driver for how we invest. Um, you know, we, we, we're not shy about that. We don't, we don't go into any investments unless we could, there's a clear sustainability agenda there and we can genuinely um, minimise our impact on the environment. And also if we can make sure we're, we're demonst demonstrating proper long-term social values being delivered. So I think, um, in direct answer to your question, the dial has moved, but I think it's been moving for a while. And I think the focus has, the focus is, has become much more um, prominent in 2020 because, you know, everyone's asking us now and we've got to deliver on it. Great. We may just pick up on some of those themes that, that you quite rightly mentioned there. So, so thank you very much for setting the, the scene. Turning to Pete, um, the value of social, socially responsible, uh, ethical, uh, green investments is absolutely there. But how do we balance that with the commercial uh, investment returns, which are still going to be pretty critical, not just in 2020, but, but beyond? Uh, I, I think it's um, a great uh, question, really important question for us to grapple with as an industry. And, you know, the first point I'd make is that um, our social role as an industry is twofold. It's both to create social impact through the investments we make, but also, you know, we can't forget it. And, and COVID has brought this into sharp relief. It's to provide financial security for the people who have entrusted their pensions and savings to us. So it's not, I think, you know, the, the worst pitfall we can fall into is say all the only social impact we have is what we build or what we invest in. We are also having a, a fantastic positive social impact in providing financial security for, in LNG's case, 8 million people's pensions who rely on LNG to put a check in their bank every week. And guess where that money comes from? It comes from the rent that occupies space. So, so there is there is a two sides to the social role, and and actually being responsible is is considering both. Um, do do I think they're um, a, a directly diametrically opposed? I, I don't think I do. Like, if I'm honest with you, I think a lot of this comes back to finding the right type of savings and capital within society to meet the need for investment. So. And, and in particular, we as an industry have got it wrong because we've been very focused on short term money to deliver um, what we need as an industry or what cities need, what places need, which is regeneration, more housing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Short term capital is often is often diametrically opposed to those kind of things, because if you're thinking on a short term mentality, it's very hard to produce great places. It's very hard to think about long term uh, retention of tenants, about creating a, a you know, a real um a, a, a catalyst for growth for startups because you're constantly focused on well actually what about this quarter or I need to be shot of this in five years because my bank's phoning me up so a lot of this actually is when we start to bring longer term pools of money then suddenly things like you know we invested last year in housing for homeless families in Croydon there's a social impact there 250 families are in homes stable addresses their kids have a kitchen table where they can do homework but we have also uh, got a very long-term income stream that we can use to pay people's pensions with. And we could never have done that in a five-year model or even a 10-year model. It wouldn't have worked. We couldn't have accepted that lower return, but we can over 40 years. So I suppose my point is, actually, I don't think for me this is about, you know, just as an industry saying, right, we're going to halve all the returns we need and just give our properties away to charity. What it's actually about doing is thinking harder and excellence for for me and what I'm striving for is that we generate both fair, decent investment returns for the people whose pensions we steward and we have a fantastic positive social impact through the investments we make. Yeah, so lots of uh, positive positive thoughts there, uh, Pete. T turning to Alex, um, again, do you think the goalposts have changed, Alex? Are those investments, the right investments, just, just harder to achieve at the moment? I think Elida is exactly right in what she said that this has been coming down the track for a while. So I, almost every presentation I give, I tend to cite uh, Larry Fink, who's the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, you know, the world's largest asset manager, 5.7 trillion under management. And he does kind of a letter to investors. And in 2018, he, his letter said, society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. And he essentially went on to say, it's no longer enough just to generate a financial commercial return. You must make a contribution to society. You know, and he's followed that up by talking about ESG and talking about social impact. 
and and you know you can see Goldman Sachs starting to embed those kind of policies. So you know we we are an industry that tends to follow the big dogs when they make a move, and you know so that will that was happening anyway. That that was coming. Whether um, I think the balance is is to, to Pete's point about the the expectations of pensions and their understanding it has been something I've really noticed. So we've closed a number of new investments into some of our funds with some very large pension advisors and questions in the hundreds around kind of ESG factors that we simply would not have got two to three years ago, other than a kind of broad, are you vaguely sustainable? Are you vaguely ethical? They're drilling down into much more detail. Um, you know, it was announced yesterday that the BP pension fund, which is the largest in the UK, are pushing for net zero by 2035 across their entire portfolio. So, you know, th these wheels are in motion and they were before COVID. Is it getting harder to find? You know, it's always it's always been hard to find like the great deals. You know that land is land pricing in this country is crazy, and um, viability is a challenge. And, and the time frame over which you need to make your return is exactly as Pete says is a real challenge. So you, you can have really aligned investors with great aspirations, but trying to lock everything into a five year model becomes very very tricky. So we're very fortunate at PFP Capital that we have very long term, you know, 25, 30 year investors, so we can take decisions around place making and community that would be much harder for you know a, a not necessarily a rapacious investor but a traditional private equity house so i think the other bit is to understand the difference between what we can do with new kit and actually the the, the point that elida made about you know that our industry and construction we can all build a, a net zero building relatively easy if we decide to kind of fund it but actually 48 percent of global emissions are from existing buildings and the retrofit challenge is the elephant in the room that nobody really wants you know i did some work with the World Economic Forum 12, 13 years ago on this. And it's it's never it, it's too difficult to address the fact that we have all this embedded carbon, we have all this already, and that retrofit is actually a real challenge. So for funds that we have that have existing portfolios, it's much, much harder to, to make them sustainable. It's not impossible, but it's harder um, than doing it all with the new shiny stuff. And I think we need to acknowledge that as part of the conversation for the industry. You mentioned uh, I mean ESG there and um you know there's so much talk about esg and it's really important that, that i guess we, we start and understand what that means for the, the forward-looking piece do, do, do you think there is a great enough understanding alex in in the sector about what we mean by by ESG? absolutely not no there what are hundreds what do we do, I mean, do, we do to same, promote them so the same way that there's sort of 300 different definitions of sustainability depending on what you want it to mean and it, and, you know, we are an industry that loves our acronyms. So that in itself can be a bit of a challenge. You know, I've been in a meeting when I was a civil servant. I was in a meeting about CSR that went on for 15 minutes before three of us realised we were talking about different things. One was talking about the corporate spending review and one was talking about corporate social responsibility and there was something else. So um, that is problematic. I'm chairing a working group at the BPF around ESG and residential. Again, because a lot of the work in this space has been done around frankly, the quick wins that are office buildings and so it's much more easy to control. Um, when you're talking about people's homes and, and how you leverage the kind of the utility of the energy that they're using, that's a much more sensitive and complex uh, equation. But we are doing some work on that. So it'd be great for kind of colleagues who might want to get involved to contact us about that. Um, but I think there are increasingly, you know, there's a huge swathe of events about ESG now. There is broader understanding that it's not just the greenwash tick box that I think a lot of people thought it was. And particularly, I think the social value points, there have been lots of social value indices across a range of different providers and some of the social housing angle and some more broad. I think I would expect to see a few more of those starting to link in together over the next few years. Yeah, Pete. No, I was just going to say that my career has been basically 12 years behind Alex's, but I, I finally caught on to Shut the retrofit up. thing that she was, uh, <laughs> she was on 13 years ago. But it, genuinely, for me, that's a classic example of um, you know, I, I've done a huge amount of work on that actually in lockdown and uh, with a whole team of us from, from LNG. It, it's, it's a fascinating space because it's one of those where actually huge positive environmental impact, uh, huge social impact, job creation, leveling up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and actually the numbers work now because things like solar, I, I don't know what it was like, you know, a few years ago, but actually we're at this point where... where uh, with solar and things that actually stack up and they generate the income you need to pay someone's pension. So that those we're, we're actually in a situation where as a country, you're certainly coming out the other side of COVID and, you know, we've got very live discussions with Treasury and people like that around us at the moment. There's a win-win-win for us. I, I suppose I was coming back to the point I was trying to make earlier that it's not about 
us needing to give away solar panels, we can actually dip it, take hold of the millions of people's pensions we have in the UK and put it to good, which is exactly what people want their pensions to, <laughs> to be doing, by the way. So, so it, it's just about us doing our job better and, and working that bit harder. And I think um, to your point about do, does our industry understand ESG, I think our industry sometimes focuses on ourselves. And actually, if we think about how people uh, engage with the ESG debate, I think we can have we can start a different conversation. For example, we work, we work largely in towns and towns and cities that are quite urban, quite dense, and we have to have difficult conversations with local people and businesses about, you know, yes, we want to be net zero. That means that we don't want any car parking spaces in the scheme. That means we have to encourage you, your residents and everyone else to have to think about sustainable modes of transport. And I think we've got to be able to have those difficult conversations and rather than sometimes we focus on ourselves and actually forget that actually the people who are our occupiers or our end users are in a completely different, um, diff completely different um, time zone when we talk about ESG. So I think we've got to bring those conversations together much more. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I've had more conversations about sustainability strategies in the last six months than, than, than probably the last 20, 20 years. I'm just interested in a, a brief word from each of each of the panel, actually, on where we think um, organisations might just need to get to in relation to that sustainability strategy. And, and, and views on where you set your baseline, because I don't think 2020 might be the uh, right year to, to, to create your baseline, but perhaps a view from each of you on that wider wider sustainability strategy piece. Alex, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so, I mean, as our, our wider, our parent group, Places for People group, which is a very large sort of housing association and regeneration company in the UK, has had sustainability is one of the core principles for kind of 20 years and so has a huge amount of data that we've been able to pull on in that um and so as we get asked more complex questions for different specific bits of our business um we're quite fortunate that we probably collect more data than most have i think what's different it, it is a bugbear of mine across industries is the very siloed nature of how we deliver places and of how real estate works and that frankly that the you know the formula that I have to fill in or that Pete might have to fill in from a fund management perspective doesn't necessarily tie into colleagues of mine who are in construction or are in kind of frontline customer service roles and frontline management and, and there's a there's an inability to be holistic and st strategic because it, it essentially each of those business lines does operate quite discreetly on its own and so it's very hard to get overarching metrics that work for everybody. Um, and I think I would say that's an ongoing challenge that we have in a business that does try to be more holistic than most Sure. Pete? Yeah, so we've, a, we've got a, a very public aim to make all of our new homes net zero carbon by 2030. Uh, so I think that'd be pretty good going. Um, and that's across, you know, all the various bits of LNG, the, the registered provider, the Carla, uh, later living, um, build to rent, etc. Um, I, I mean, beyond that, it, it does go back to that point I mentioned, uh, and I think Alex is absolutely right, that the importance of, of retrofitting. I mean, that my absolute bugbear is us as an industry saying, well, our response to this is going to be to sell a buildings that aren't sustainable enough because <laughs> I don't, we're not going to deal with them. I don't know who we think is, you know, if someone yeah. with the firepower of an M&G or an Adiva or, a, you know, place the people can't deal with this issue, I don't know who we think is going to deal with them. So selling off, you know, might be good if you've got uh, shares in British American tobacco. It doesn't work when you've got buildings. It's, it's an, an issue we need to kind of and that's actually a really key thing just as an example it's not the big flash exciting thing of opening a new kind of solar farm or you know doing a brand new master plan for a new community but we have a program of very basic window retrofit going through a lot of our existing portfolio that makes a massive difference and it's not immediately for us but over time it should reduce things like ongoing maintenance issues and it should mean warmer flat and lower bills for the customer you know that is expenditure that you could arguably not say was necessary but it is part of the commitment of just trying to acknowledge that retrofitting a portfolio takes time but it's just those gradual incremental benefits you, you can do. Yeah. Alidi, but final uh, thoughts from yourself on that? As a business we, we declared a climate, emer climate and ecological emergency and across all our schemes we are pushing to, for higher levels of sustainability and we are pushing for net zero in operation by 2030. I suppose one of the challenges that we face is once we have these aspirations and these ambitions to do much more, when we go into certain locations, we are impeded by um, 
horrible word, planning, um, you know, to get to pass go, you need to connect to a district heat system, which immediately means that all our ambitions and aspirations pretty much get disappear. Um, and that's what I'm going to challenge you to. And whilst we, we push as much as we can, sometimes the ball is sometimes out of our court. So that, that's a big challenge for us. Thank you. Perhaps moving on to technology and just picking up a sort of few questions around the role that, that technology can play in this changing uh, agenda. Um, Alex, I think I think there's no doubt that technology plays a pretty significant role in, in, in all of this, creating that sort of level playing field and for perhaps that sort of greater diversity. It would, would be great to sort of get your thoughts on, on, on some of the specifics around that. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's the sort of terminology soup that our industry likes to have. So everyone talks about prop tech, but I don't think anyone necessarily agrees like what they mean by that. But for me, I think we tend to get blinded by the kind of whizzy gadget or the tech and, you know, very, very, again, narrow elements rather than looking at kind of the ecosystem of real estate in place, which is probably what we need to grapple with more in terms of technology. So you know, in, in Bristol over the I mean, fair share, the charity do a huge amount of amazing work on food poverty, which is always an issue in schools other days, but particularly so in um, in lockdown. And actually digital poverty was something that kind of came aligned with that, where you know people were being just expected to do remote learning, but you'd have households of maybe six with only one device that could connect limited broadband, limited, you know, um, ability to purchase that kind of that, that they need. And I think it's all very easy. Yes, it's all tech enabled, um, but actually the barriers to access are sometimes a little bit hidden, particularly from our kind of very kind of middle class industry that doesn't necessarily have insight into that. So I, I have a real bit about looking at it system rather than just the individual gadgets. Having said that, there's lots of cool gadgets you know, that have been in use for a really long time. So in our, our care and support business, they've been using smart sensors for things like um, heating and movement in, um, for, for years now. And in a way that's not intrusive, it's not cameras, but allows you to be able to check up on an elderly resident who maybe would normally have been up and about by a certain point. And you know, if there hasn't been that movement, then perhaps they just need to check. You know, that is really, really important to help prevent isolation, I think. Post COVID, we're certainly looking at things around air quality sensors, and that I think will become standard. Um, and then I'm, you know, outside PFP Capital, I'm on the board of a company called the Census, which is the largest um, global kind of provider of flex office software. And you know, the, the data that they have as kind of global platform to see how people are using that that remote working thing that was already the norm for some of us, but it's become something that companies, whether they like it or not, they've had to grapple with and how to do effectively. You know, we've all had. In our prep call a bit of a moment about you know various companies it policies and security and how you then balance that with you know enabling people to get on with their job so i think there are all sorts of exciting opportunities that will come from this but the, the challenge is that you can get very bought into you know a particular tech solution that very quickly gets leapfrogged so you know you, you can i would say you can be the mini disc which was technically a brilliant solution and every muso's preferred tool but actually then the ipod came along and blew it out of the water so how you invest as an investor where people are cautious and want to know that this is going to be the thing that's going to help you either save money or make money it can get quite risky to invest in technology because suddenly you're putting this huge outlay and you need to future proof it you need to say if you're doing cat sticks cabling you need to be leaving some extra room for cables for whatever comes next because we can't think far enough ahead fast enough and for something when we're building very static assets as buildings that can become quite scary and quite expensive very quickly yeah, so some really good points there. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll pick them up a bit later uh, in, in, in the session. Um, Pete, did you see technology and business intelligence as um, an enabler, in, in particular, to open up new opportunities? So I, I don't know if I'd say new opportunities. I mean, it's, um, I think, really important post-COVID that, you know, this country, whether we're looking in Bristol, Exeter, Swindon, uh, or even, you know, Liverpool, wherever it may be, um, recognises what our strengths are as a country. And, and tech is undoubtedly one of our, our strengths. And, uh, you know, if we're going to see cities, economies come out the other side of this um, uh, downturn and, you know, people get the jobs they need um, and get, get back on their feet, uh, we, we need to be facilitating and enabling the strengths that we've got as an economy. And that's undoubtedly one. So, a lot of the investments we're making um, in cities, uh, so, you know, recent ones will be in, in Newcastle, Sunderland, we announced actually in, in lockdown, 
um, and then Bristol and Temple Island are, are, are about trying to enable this uh, tech economy to grow uh, because it's 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 good for a city. Uh, it, someone told me once that was it forty percent of the iPhone is built in Bristol. He did work for Bristol City Council, but so he you know he, he may have been talking his own book, but it was a very kind of he was very punchy about the amount. So. So my point is, there's a lot of local strengths uh, to 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 tech there. The, the other thing I'm really seeing, I'm really excited about, is you know absolutely take Alex's point around uh, the connection in in some families isn't with with tech isn't what we want it to be as a society. But undoubtedly, if we can use tech in our uh, consultations, we're going to get far wider response than we do from the traditional let's stand in a village hall with a you know screen and hope for the best kind of thing and it's only people who've got nothing better to do who pop up so so i know several of us around this screen are working with built id and people like that and that for me is genuinely exciting because you know they're, they're translating these uh, questions into somali and, and helping us and, and polish and local community languages to make sure we're really listening to a broad and across section of society so that what we're building actually meets the needs of society rather than it just being what I, me and some flashy architects fancy banging up in, you know, uh, one day in, in our office in London. So that that for me is, is if we're going to, you know, see that's tech really enabling us as an industry to meet our social role better, um, uh, you know, and very exciting for me. Yeah. Elidy, any views from, from, from yourself on the, the, the role that technology will continue to play? Yep, just to add to it, um... Well, Alex and Peter both said that I think from my perspective, tech should democratise, you know, it should enable all parts of our community to engage. And, um, and we do find that when we go into some of our most deprived communities, we forget that not everyone can afford to pay for broadband. So making sure that we enable free Wi-Fi in public areas and in our, in our, in our developments is, is a key part. But I, I firmly believe that kind of infrastructure, especially digital infrastructure, is going to be key in terms of coming out of recovery and um, coming out of COVID and simple things like, you know, we're working across many locations where we are supporting a local kind of local bids and local business groups to, you know, to kickstart, put Wi-Fi, um, 5G into these locations because 5G is a significant, um, uh, you know, is a catalyst for growth, for growing lots of different industries. Sim simple example is, you know, we because we fundamentally believe in delivering car-free, emission-free locations. We've been looking at how we can roll out cabs, um, connected autonomous vehicles across some of our some locations we work in, and five G is critical to that. Um, and you know, we have to work with local businesses to look at how can we in, in, inject that into that local area to support the um, delivery of cabs, which inevitably supports that local location even more. So I think infrastructure, particularly digital infrastructure, is a real key area that we must yeah. focus on in much more detail. Yeah, absolutely. And a really good question that's just been raised, um, which I will open up uh, to you. Can technology be used more effectively to engage with communities? Can it be used to shape developments and de deliver better outcomes? Great, great question. Really important point here. That, that, that's exactly what Pete was saying. I think we're all working with um, um, Bill ID, and we've been doing this for many years. We don't believe that standing in a community hall on a Wednesday evening between six and eight is a good representation of, of, of the cross section of the community we're working. So absolutely, we should be using technology better, whether it's, you know, making sure that we're out in, in the ways that people want to engage, social media or using our mobile technology. We've got to use that to get into the communities we, we, we want to talk to and better understand what people need and want. And also use technology to provide some proper real-time information for how places are evolving. Because I think it's very easy to show people flat plans, but actually we've got to use things that, you know, we we tend to we drop people into the scheme and stand on that road and look at how this development looks you know how does it feel for you and, it, and that's a really important way of engaging people in in, in the places that they live in so. and that's so important when you can do that in a kind of ar enabled where yeah. people are you know that kids are used to using the kind of video games they're used to seeing that you're going showing someone a shiny render that never is never what it's going to look like in the end or you know a model you know and we all I, I love a model it's great fun to kind of see but it's nothing like being able to put on a mask and actually then see yourself in that space and imagine what it's like to mm. walk around you know I worked on schemes which are brilliantly conceptualized but then you kind of get a, a bridge that has a camber that's completely impossible for anyone in a wheelchair or with a buggy with a bag on it and no one's thought to do that and you, you can't see that because it's just it was missed on the drawing and yeah. to actually think of being able to kind of tangibly experience the place before it's set in stone is really important. 
and I think as an industry, we've got to be we've got to be brave enough for that because you know we can't expect to show people shiny, beautiful CGIs and mm -hmm. think, oh great, it's going to be a wonderful place. We've got to show those those dark alleys that we probably missed, as you rightly said, those steps that actually me with a double buggy is not going to get down there. We've got to be, oh, you know, it's it can be we can't be shy about showing those because they they help to make the development a better place. So it's really important. So the big question: I, is How yeah. you, you you go first. No, I was just going to say I'm, I'm going to go for the winning the award for the statement of the bleeding obvious. But the, you know, the, this might sound like we're all harping on about trying to you know do better developments because we all care about people, which which is true. But um, actually, it, if the more people like our developments, the more successful commercially those developments will be as well. It, it, that's the kind of that's what I was trying to get at the moment right at, at the start by. This isn't just doing good for doing good's sake. Uh, there is something very sacred about improving people's lives that I, I worry gets lost in this whole ESG rush. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, it, it actually, if we can properly engage with more people and, and then create a better environment, yeah, certainly for long-term investors, you're just going to end up with better rental income over the longer term, which is better for the people's pensions you're stewarding. So it's, it, it genuinely can be a win-win. Which, which leads very nicely on to what all of this means for the, the, the Southwest. So it'd be good just to spend a bit of time just looking at the Southwest uh, market. Um, Alex, maybe I can turn to you first. Southwest has been a pretty strong market for a very long time. Um, what's your view on whether that still is a pretty strong choice for investors? Um, are we set for another sustained period of growth? Uh, keen, keen to get your perspective on all of that. Uh, as, a, as a Bristol resident for nearly 10 years, and I was born in Somerset, so I'm a proud Southwest girl. Absolutely, it's a great place to be. And I used to bang on about how in the uh, in the GFC, in the global financial crisis, Bristol was actually the only city that didn't go into technical recession through that. It stayed just above it. And part of that was because of the creative economy, you know, the, the you know, animation, the digital media, those kind of businesses. You know, Bristol's always had that quirky creative side, but actually has been able to monetize that, which is a kind of a nice allegory for what Pete's been talking about. You know, we can make money out of out of the fun stuff and the good stuff as well. Um, so I think absolutely Bristol has huge opportunity. You know, I'm really excited that for the first time in my career, I'm actually getting to work on a fairly significant scheme in my home city with, you know, in the JV with Cubex, which is really exciting. And we, you know, we're getting hopefully close to now to some exciting things around that. So I'm, I'm really passionate about actually being able to put into practice what I've learned working around the world and lots of other communities in the place where I live. And actually that, is a brilliant way to hold myself to kind of the highest possible standard because I now have to justify it to my neighbours who kind of quite frequently come and ask me what the hell's going on about, you know, whether it's the 5G consultation or, you know, well, how high is that building going to be? And actually that's quite a good way to keep yourself honest. So I'm, I'm very passionate about opportunities for the wider Southwest. I think we've always been good at, at clean energy and, you know, whether people have used power, nuclear has clearly been a big part of the West, the West Country's kind of energy mix for a long time, but there's interesting things going on with the proposals around gravity for the down from kind of the M5. And I think we could be a real pioneer. The, the, the note of kind of cynical caution that I have to flag, I think, because I think it's dishonest not to, is that yes, we talk a good game and we were the kind of EU green capital as Bristol in 2015. And, you know, we have incredible, more kind of cyclists, I think per head even than London. But we also have areas of the worst air quality in Europe. You know, we, th there are real issues with the kind of the, the, what's quite often kind of a white middle-class hobbyist sustainability campaign and actually what we're delivering in those places. You know, it, it's very, very car dependent, particularly for kind of people coming into Bath and Bristol and Taunton and the main kind of from outside. And, you know, we need to get much more bold about addressing that because we're not living up to what we could potentially do. Which links very neatly, um, Alidi, to some of the points that you were making earlier as well. Um, what, what are your thoughts on sort of the southwest, the, the, the Bristol piece in, in particular? Uh, we're new entrants to Bristol. We've, we've only been in Bristol for about 18 months. Um, we are working on a major development um, near Old Market, which is the, um, we are re repurposing the old Gardner Haskins listed building and um, alongside that. So we are retaining all the embodied carbon in that. Um, and we are also delivering about 200 homes and about 150,000 square feet of, of workspace. So for us, um, you know, Bristol is an area is, is a city that we, we've fallen we've fallen in love with for many years and haven't found the right opportunity and we're really pleased to be to be working on this. Um, 
And I think, as I mentioned earlier on, sustainability and social value is fundamental to the work that we do. And that's been that's deeply ingrained into the DNA of this project that we're working on. Um, you know, we are absolutely car free. We are not delivering any car parking on our scheme. So we're, th we're striving to be completely emission free, sustainable transport throughout, because you know, we, we, we have heard from local people and local businesses that air quality is shocking in Bristol. So we don't, we don't think we should be contributing in any way, shape or form to that at all. In fact, we should be trying to improve it. Hence why we are, we're delivering over 150 new plant species into the area so that we can positively impact, so, you know, make a positive contribution in terms of biodiversity to try and make it, to look at how we can impact on that. Um, and I think on, on the other side for us, social value, you know, whilst Bristol is very successful and does very well, there are significant issues around deprivation in Bristol that, you, you know, we can, again, you know, I, I think Pete said earlier on, you know, good places result in good financial um, results, but importantly from our conscience, we can't deliver a 250 million pound scheme and know that we have not made a positive contribution to the lives of people who are in challenging environment in a challenging life environment so we spend a lot of time um, delivering a, a really comprehensive social value framework where we we do a needs analysis understand what the local issues are and there are sometimes things that we can't directly impact on so there's fuel poverty, health and well-being, childhood obesity. These are things that, as a developer, you know, we we generally don't know what to do, and we have to find the right partnerships and the relationships to help us deal with those. Because our scheme has to make an, a positive impact, and it's not not just about throwing money at it. It's about genuinely trying to understand it, make sure that we're not negatively contributing in any way, shape, or form to that, and finding ways and partnerships to help deal with those and help find the right right right, right long-term solutions um so i suppose that's what that's that's kind of our our southwest journey and, cool. and it's been 18 months in and we're, we're looking forward to doing much more brilliant great great to hear pete i i'm just thinking actually as we were speaking we should talk more um interesting on your uh, your point about health we would with, uh, with our uh, temple island uh uh, project we were actually due to meet the public health board for Bristol just before lockdown and then obviously sadly they've been quite busy um but it would actually be probably quite interesting for the three of us to to meet them together because I think for me yeah. one of the engagements we never really made because as an industry is actually how do our developments sorry forgive me Anne, you you probably have done again and I'm going to catch you up in five years <laughs> how do, uh, I think between our, our developments and public health is actually there is a huge amount of uh, literature that shows there's a very clear link um, but actually, you know, trying to properly engage with the public health board and say, so what are the implications of that in terms of our design? Um, as I say, so now I was quite excited about doing just before lockdown, but if you, if you guys want to join that meeting. I would, you're on my list. I actually only did it two weeks ago, so it's not five years, but we, ah. I did a session with the Health Foundation where they got a load of public health directors and NHS directors from across London, but specifically to talk about health and real estate. And uh, Richard Mayer from Stories and I'm with both spoke to them we shared a lot of the kind of ULI work that we've done on kind of health and real estate there but it was fascinating because none of them knew how to engage you know very senior medical professionals how to engage and they kept saying we're dealing with all the outcomes of badly planned and badly delivered developments but we don't know where we can intervene so one of the things we do want yeah. to do from that is try and have a kind of conversation like this with people like you and Elida and others because actually I think we can be those kind of pioneers and starting to have those conversations at the early stage when you do need to do it um, and I also yeah. love, I always like to give a shout out to the Centric Lab. So Josh Artis and Araceli Camargo do phenomenal work on linking like health and science to real estate and asking mm. really uncomfortable questions, but that we do need to grapple with. So I think, you know, yeah, we should continue that conversation. I'll send you That's such an important, say, such um, important area. Five, yeah. Less than five years ago, we, we've got a big scheme on the Olympic Park where we own 1,379 homes. And actually out of that, we did a big research piece with um, UCL, who are also based in Olympic Park, to look at how, as a result of the development and also the access to green space, access to sports and facilities, how does that, if in any way, positively contribute to the health and well-being? So it was a two-year study that did a benchmark at the start of when people moved in and then went back in regular periods and looked at people who were either in social rented homes, in built-to-rent homes market, and also who had bought their homes and studied that. And it, it came up with some really interesting results. So when we do catch up, we'll be able to share some of that insight. Brilliant. Um, right, quite a few questions now coming in in, in relation to uh, Southwest. So uh, a couple of strands to this one. Um, 
of course, has been the acceleration of home working, remote working to a pretty significant extent. And lots of talk at the moment about that migration from London to the regions and southwest has been highlighted, of course, as, as one of those areas that is likely to see that, that housing and economic growth. Um, who wants to kick me off with a view uh, in relation to whether the southwest will benefit from the migration from London? Sounds like you, uh, Pete. Shall I, shall I have a go from, from my office in the centre of London? <laughs> I, uh, so I, I have to say, again, I, I can see this being recorded and played back to me in five years time when I turn out to be totally wrong um, but I, my money is on the the office surviving um, I think people like that interaction um, I don't see the death of an, the office I, I do see the reinvention of the office and uh, I, I certainly expect uh, office requirements to, to reduce uh, but actually on the flip side not by that much because I think the collaboration space uh, and the kind of as Alex put it earlier the tangible collaboration space the ability to, to be together um, is so important, um, and you know that for me. So that on that one, I'm I'm I you know made my made my bet, placed my bets as it were, and we will see. On the kind of will the southwest benefit from the migration from London? I mean, you know, just forgive me for being slightly cynical, but I I'd ask how what you mean by benefit, and I don't want to be a kind of pernickety academic about it, but a bunch of yuppies piling into your city may or may not be a good thing you know i'm sure if you're a developer and you were building a ton of yuppie flats it probably is a good thing but socially does that really benefit your city so for me you know there's there is i think i'm less interested in that and more interested in are we meeting the needs of the people who are in bristol and as we said you know there is a huge range of uh, people and earnings and demographics within that city and how can we build to meet those needs? Um, I'm not really that interested, to be frank, in, in building flats for yuppies in London to come and buy. No offence to yuppies in London. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a big thing. I always talk about DFL, so down from London's, which is a kind of, you know, in the, the rural Somerset village that I grew up in, which is now incredibly fashionable and, and full of people. Learning. There is the classic... Uh, resistance from people who've been there for generations saying my child can no longer buy a house here you know for a long time you've had people living in, in kind of bigger urban accommodations and commute com um Bristol and Bath and commuting back to work in very low paying farm jobs before going actually do you know what I can I can get a retail job well, pre COVID and that that would pay me more and I not have to get up so early so you know there's that the second home kind of issue which is you know you're absolutely entitled to have them and it's great and you contribute a lot to the economy but in terms of you know people's sense of who's who's a local who's allowed to be there and how long you have to have been somewhere to count as a local and that kind of thing it, it gets you know though in particularly in rural communities that can be really really sensitive um so i think obviously there'll be a, a flow of people and, and it'll be interesting to see how those people embed and engage in the communities that they come into but equally you know cities exist for a reason and you know the, all these kind of articles about the death of the city from covid i, I don't like, like i don't buy that you know i live in a city center i choose to live in a city center as much as i love the countryside i love being able to walk everywhere and not needing my car i love being able to kind of again post pre-covid but have a theater on the, my doorstep and a load of different restaurants and different languages and cultures and things i can experience um i think it will be interesting in terms of the job the labor market and the competitiveness that things like london waiting or if you're in the us you know the kind of the assumption that a job in san francisco or new york would be double the salary of anywhere else but if that job can now be done from anywhere that's going to be some equalization which will be quite interesting but I, I think we will still, as a, as a species, we're drawn to one another. Those kind of conurbations exist because people like that. And it will be about how those spaces are used in different ways. So again, to the tech thing, I, we're, we're so rigid in allocating red lines around, you know, this space is for that and this space is for that. What Anthony Slumbers coined a few years ago is space as a service and understanding you can have that mix. One of my favorite venues in Bristol is a, is a hairdresser that also sells amazing plants, does gigs in the evening, and has a little kind of coffee shop in it. And it's just this amazing multifaceted space that's sort of buzzing for 20 hours of the day in Old Market, quite near. I don't, if I lied, if I haven't been, I'll tell you, it's wicked. But it, it doesn't fit neatly into any one single use. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see more of that. 
Yeah, and I'm asked to challenge you guys on one point. We're talking about the Southwest here, and the question is, is, is the Southwest too Bristol centric? We've got other major centres here, Exeter, Plymouth, for example. Uh, would, would the panel invest in the likes of those other, other centres? So perhaps I could just turn to each of you for a, a view on that. We do. Um, <laughs> we have, and I'm looking at a lot of deals that I can't tell you about, but yes, of course, I think there's an acknowledgement that it's harder when, you know, in terms of securing um, underwrites for investors who, who get confused outside core cities and get nervous about scale um, on an institutional side, for the scale opportunity that we look at, certainly in the funds that I look after, they don't they don't necessarily present themselves that often, but certainly in our other funds, absolutely, we, we have stuff there. If, um, if Alex is held accountable by her neighbours, I'm held accountable by my mum in Gloucester watching Points West. And, you know, she always gives me a telling off if I'm uh, coming across badly. So very, very um, rooted in, in the southwest where, where I grew up and would love to invest more in those places. Um, I will just say this. Um, Bristol's, particularly since the, the new administration, has been very proactive in tapping up the best of the industry uh, to try and deliver a great place and from my perspective and um has laid a bit of a gauntlet down to other local authorities i think locally to say look you know we're going to actually really grab the bull by the horns here and change our place and pick our partners who we want to do that so um you know there's some great partners on the screen in front of me um and and i think that has for me we're very driven by local authorities um working collaboratively with us and having a vision for what they want their place to be that we can back up with expertise and, and long-term investment um so yeah hopefully we can do more of that but um i'm sure the others will also have an impact to make as well elida you describe your love for bristol could, could that love be, be be shared a bit wider do you think i i certainly hope so as i said we fall in love with bristol in the southwest and as someone who's also regularly goes to see family in Taunton, um, I've fallen in love with much wider. So absolutely, I think, uh, as, as Pete said, we we work very closely with local authorities who, who are proactive and want to see um, good growth in their, in their towns and cities. So as long as we can have those types of partnerships and relationships, we're, we're happy to work, work in, this, in, in the Southwest. Brilliant. Um, partnership, that leads on very nicely to uh, another question that we've had in and, and, and the phrase that I think we will become very, very used to going forward, build back better. So does the present crisis and the need to build back better drive the need for real collaboration between public and private sectors? Is there a game changing opportunity for better outcomes? So again, perhaps turning to each of you there uh, for, for a view. Those two have both got partnership in their job titles, so they can oh. go first. <laughs> go on, Lydia, you go first. Um, I, I, I think for me, I don't think the present crisis um, is, the, is the reason why we should work in partnership. I think we should always work in partnership. Um, I think the public and the private sector, there's been obviously historical challenges with that, and there's always an element of mistrust. But I think if we're going to deliver anything of substance or of good we've got to work in partnership and whether it's a formal partnership in a you know joint venture whether or whether it's an informal partnership for me everything we do in any town or city has to be with the public sector um, and has to ha we have to build up relationship build up partnership so that we can jointly de deliver deliver well and I think in terms of building back better I think you know it's it, part part of me cringes a little bit because I think it, the focus is always on building, and actually what we need to do is 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 we need to main also, also maintain and also strengthen. And I think there's some I, I know it, it might not sound like a play on words, but I think the focus is always on that physical thing of we've got to build build a physical thing. And actually, there's so much more to do before we even get to that point. And we've got to focus on all of that and and get the ground ready, get the relationships ready, get the community actually really on side and supportive and, and we're responding well to those challenges before we get to the point of building so yeah for, i mean i would just say it, it, we've had the busiest six months probably I've, I've known because um central government and local authorities have all been in very very regular contact about this is what we've realized we as a city need to or as a country need to to rebound from this um, and thankfully they've, you know, recognised there's, there's huge amounts of savings and pensions in the UK that can be tapped up to do good 
uh, mm -hmm. to help that recovery to happen. Um, some really proactive local authorities, and I, I'm definitely including Bristol in that, um, and Exeter, to be fair. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it, it's never been more important, taking nothing away from what was just said. Um, it, it, this is, this is, it's a natural, uh, a national um, cause. This is it's a genuine social uh, need that we have to step up together. So, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the 1930s, I think it was, when there was a huge stock market crash. And the only thing that really arrested it was the government finally getting together with some of the key um, largest financial institutions and saying, right, we're gonna buy at this price. This has gone far enough. Uh, it's time to see us coming out the other side of that. And uh, I'm certainly not speaking just on behalf of LNG with that. I think there's a genuine call to our industry at the moment to be investing back into cities, not to build junk, I absolutely agree, but to, to genuinely build back better and, and you know build back with zero carbon, car free, all these fantastic things that we're talking about. Um, but people's like livelihoods are depending on us doing that and us not sticking our heads in the sand for the next five years and seeing what it looks like at the end of it because you know that that is the way to spiral down so you know back to the earlier thing about southwest how is the southwest doing for me it shapes if we can shape our own destiny on this there are you know, tens of billions of pounds in places you know financial institutions around the uk lng has 120,000 customers in bristol alone and we should be using their pensions and savings to help the Southwest coming out the other side of this. Yeah. I think just really quickly, the only thing I'd add is that that negative stereotype about public private partnerships failing tends to be predicated on the assumption that, you know, the private sector is rapacious, greedy, short termist. And, you know, I think we've demonstrated you know, that, that, that that ESG push is not just us as sort of maybe people who've been doing it a bit longer, but that there is a real shift in the kind of real estate business around understanding that you know, doing the right thing also helps you make more money. But also that there are, you know, the public sector stereotypes about being kind of indecisive or slow or you know, overly lined to political timetables rather than anything else. And actually, you know, there's stereotypes exist for a reason. There's, there's always, you know, been negative situations. But equally, one of the things we have to acknowledge is capacity constraints and skills constraints. And things are moving so fast now. And when we have, you know, local authorities under enormous pressure, you know, planning, you know, everyone, you know we can all moan and beat up the planning system and whatever is going on with it. But actually... You know, officers doing the very best that they can in kind of underpaid, under-resourced teams, very under-supported. There is a responsibility for us to work in partnership, not just to point the finger and go, it's their fault that this hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, I think it's up to authorities to be a bit more open-minded when they're approached by private sector partners, that we're not just in it for the, for the financial return, and that actually investors are much more sophisticated and understanding a commitment to a place and you know, the responsibilities that they're taking on. And I think I'd like to see you know, more of those, the successful partnerships that, you know, that we have, that Pete has at LNG, Elida has at First Base and others, because they demonstrate that it can be done, but it takes time. And time is the thing, unfortunately, I don't think we have a lot of. A couple of questions there that directly linked to the planning point there, there, there Alex. Um, is, is there more that we, we, we need to see in terms of that sort of support, that the, the framework for planning, we've got the planning white paper, um, talk of zonal planning systems. What's your view on any sort of plea for, for further support to enable a lot of this to happen? Uh, in a strictly personal, not a housekey kind of way, so I don't get shouted at by my compliance director. Um, and and an, as an urbanist geek, I think the planning paper uh, chucks up lots of really interesting ideas for how you would create a planning system from scratch. What I don't think it does do is explain how you would transition from the current system to what it's proposing. And as someone who you know, was a civil servant at the point when um, you know, the RDAs were really quite influential and important in how urban kind of development happened in, across the UK, that you can still see that there are areas of the country that have complete policy vacuum because they didn't then get covered by a LEP or a combined authority. You know, I, think, I think the unintended consequences of you know, these kind of sweeping simplification decisions for things that sometimes it's not simple. Sometimes what we do is really complex and policy needs to be complex in order to, to manage that. That doesn't mean we can't communicate it better, but you know, I, I worry about that. Also with a, a trustee hat on as a co-chair of the Creative Land Trust, one of the things that we've set up is a planning for the future.co.uk because nothing in that planning reform document talks about the value of culture, of art, of music, the Arts Council England did some research a couple of weeks ago that they released that showed that 75% of our kind of country's cultural heritage kind of music venues are within a five minute walk of the high street. But 
when we're talking about reinventing the system, there's been no mention so far of those really critical assets. And it's the kind of thing where we will lose them and then go, oh, we needed, we, we wish we'd had them, but they haven't been factored in because it's been oversimplified to just be about housing numbers. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, I think those things are, are an issue. Very conscious of time, we are 25 past, but what I would like to invite each of uh, you to do is, you know, what are the real priorities for the next five years with all of the things that we've talked about in the sustainability, investment, uh, net zero agenda? So, so perhaps I could just turn to each of you for a final word in, in relation to the priorities, where, where we need real focus to, to start and make this really important difference. Um, Elida, perhaps I could start with, with you. Um, I guess over the next five years for us, um, it's reaffirming and delivering on, on what we said we would do. We've made some pretty big, um, uh, uh, we've set some pretty big targets for, our, for ourselves um, as a business, but also for our projects in terms of delivering sustainability, delivering on social value. And I think an area that certainly in Bristol has, um, I think 2020 has, has sh shined a uh, even more important light on is around diversity. And I think, you know, as, you know, as, as operating in Bristol, we've got to make sure that we are encouraging and enabling a very diverse, diverse number of voices into the schemes that we're creating. So for example, we've been working with people like Black Southwest and Cognitive Minds to help improve diversity in procurement so that when we are going out and we're looking for suppliers and contractors to work with us, we can make sure that we're looking at a really broad pool of, of uh, businesses to, 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 to engage. Because I think that's that's not just saying that we're going to do something, that's actually delivering. Mm -hmm. So for me, in the next five years, they're about, we set these targets, we've got to deliver on them, we've got to create genuinely good places, which we do. We've got to make sure that our community buys into that, support that, um, and are sitting side by side with us on, 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 on with all of those. Alex. Yeah, so I always just come back to kind of to the Jane Jacobs or whichever kind of urbanist you want to list, but successful places put people first. So exactly as like, no, there's a reason that I, I went to work for places for people because I like it does what it says on the tin. It's about that understanding that it's not just the numbers on the spreadsheet and the assets. It's, a, it's about a community and people, um, which can be frustrating and awkward and time consuming, but is the right thing to do. Um, and I think it's great that our industry is, is kind of the, the sea changes happening that we're, more of us are taking that seriously. But for the Southwest over the next few years, it's to recognize that that the easy way of hitting housing numbers or delivering the same kind of thing or you know the same old kit that we've done before is not necessarily the right thing. So it's that future-proofing mindset around all the clean energy stuff we've talked about, around a mix of tenures. It's, it's really, really crucial that we need social housing, but we and we need um, every other tenure all the way up from it. And they all need to be funded and supported. And then that mix is really critical. And and we need to do all of that in partnership and be okay with taking a bit of risk because if COVID has shown us anything is that you know, nobody had COVID on their risk register, right? However good your compliance director was, nobody had the, the scale of this yeah. on their risk register. But we are all adapting and adjusting. And so that future-proofing thing doesn't need to be as scary. I think we've shown that you can do it. And I'd, I'd love to see the Southwest pioneer a bit more risk-taking around these kind of newer ideas at scale because I think we could really lead the way in that. Pete, final word. Well, I've been utterly overshadowed by so, so much that I agree with everything that's just been said. And, and I have to say, particularly just what Alex said there for me about putting people at the centre of this, because if there's one thing that worries me, it's that this wave of ESG just becomes a fad. And, um, you know, people, I, I never forget, I was sat at a round table with a developer recently. It certainly was not first base, I'm very proud to say. And they just randomly told me they had delivered nine million pounds of social value that year. And I got the impression the guy didn't have the first clue what that actually meant in terms of what he had done to improve anyone's life. It's just some consultant that told him he delivered that. So... For me, it's so important over the next few years that if the industry moves in the direction I think we all want it to, that we do so respecting the sanctity. And particularly, you know, one of the things we didn't get onto is, is around alternative asset classes. More and more investment is going to move into affordable housing, um, you know, shared ownership, uh, build to rent, it, it, actually a step up, step down accommodation for the NHS. Yeah. These all have the potential to do fantastic good. But we've got to remember it's people's lives we're actually affecting here as an industry uh, for better or for worse and and we will all have an impact it's just a question of whether it's going to be a good impact or not so five years from now let's regroup and make sure it's a positive impact 
some really good closing thoughts. As always, far too many questions than, than the time available, but you've been an absolutely brilliant panel. And I think I'm going to hand back to Simon. There we go. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you to a lady. Uh, thank you to Pete, Alex, and obviously our fabulous chair, Maria. Um, absolutely fascinating session. I think that, that could have gone on for hours. I'm sure you probably all agree and it's all the really juicy content, but fascinating from everybody. So many valid points. It's a little bit like the Oscars. If I start naming things, I'm going to leave people off my thank you list and, and, and what have you. But, you know, we've discussed loads of things from retrofitting to loads of technology points, 5G, biodiversity, plants, community engagement, clean air quality, Public health, you know, so really, top, it's a really, really topical and really valuable, um, really valuable points. Um, but the one thing that stood out for me was, and it's fabulous to hear that you all were totally genuine and passionate about these topics, and that really you could hear and you could feel that come across. And so, so thank you for that. And it's and it's great to it's great to get that feeling from you as a as a, as a panel. I'm, I'm sure people who are who have dialed in will 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 probably appre or should appreciate that as well. Um, it's obviously not a straightforward topic. Lots has changed. And lots has changed in the last 12 months. Um, it will change in the next 12 months massively. But you know, the topic today was, or one of the side topics, was balancing commerciality of social responsibility and sustainability. Um, and it's and it's great to see that still remains, not remains. It's even higher in everyone's agenda than it has been in the past. And I think that's absolutely critical. Um, you know, COVID has accelerated it, obviously, uh, and it's fascinating to get, you, to get your views on that. And it'll be fascinating to have probably a similar conversation 12 months time. Um, I, just, I do worry for any yuppies that relocate to Bristol. They might get harpooned by Pete at some point, but uh, I, might, I, might send a, I might send a warning out to them. But um, I'm sure they're very, very welcome. Um, today's session will be available on YouTube. Um, so we, we, we and Shakes have a YouTube channel. Uh, all our sessions will be on there. In the not too distant future, this session will also join that list. Um, if you see a session, today's session, or, or indeed a previous one, please please forward it on to a friend or colleague that you may find, uh, or they may find of interest. Um, upcoming events, uh, Thursday, uh, October the 15th at half past 12, reforming the planning uh, game process, um, sponsored by Terence O'Rourke, uh, set to be another fascinating uh, session in the panel that we've uh, we've developed with Terence O'Rourke um, on to Monday. I'm sure some of you may be involved in in the um, in the housing festival that Monday, the 19th of October, uh, at 12 o'clock to so 12 noon. Um, the uh, Regeneration Brainries, the Brainies, are going to interview Mayor Marvin Rees, uh, who's obviously the Mayor of Bristol, at as I said, the Bristol Housing Festival. Both sessions are free to attend, so please get those in the diary if they are of interest. Um, a special mention again uh, to TLT for sponsoring today. Uh, thank you to the panellists again. Thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I hope you have found it of value. Uh, and from everyone at Movers and Shakers, have a great weekend. Stay safe. And thanks once again for joining us. Cheerio. Thanks. <laughs>